So it's good to be with you today and to be a part of this time. I was especially excited, as, as always, to be invited to come and share with you and preach from this pulpit, but especially today because the Gospel of John, you, I guess maybe you can't say you have a favorite gospel, but I've got a favorite gospel, and the Gospel of John is that one that enlightens to me some of the intimacy of the life of Christ in a very special way. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are wonderful, and we learn so much from them, but gospel the Gospel of John, written by the beloved disciple, the disciple literally in the Greek, the disciple whom Jesus loved like a brother. We have details in that Gospel we don't have in any other place. And it's a privilege this morning to, to be with you and to share uh, in this series of, 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 of celebration of the signs uh, that Jesus shared. Uh, in fact, if you remember, and you know, skip over to the 20th chapter, uh, the signs are very special, for it is, it, well, that, that verse there in, in chapter 20, verse 30 and 31 says, there are many signs that, of Jesus that are not written in this book, but these were written that you may believe and that you might have life. Powerful, powerful signs. Now, I used to teach... Old Testament and New Testament to freshmen and sophomores. It was a great pleasure of mine to stand up on the day that I would introduce them to the Gospel of John and say, John, in John you will find no miracles of Jesus. And immediately I would see those kids that had been in Bible school uh, and in Sunday school going through their Bible and looking at me and frowning and I'd say, no, uh, that you won't find the word miracles, but you will find the word sign. Because in the Gospel of John, those signs have a special meaning. Now, the scripture for today is a special scripture that has so much meaning and powerful messages, messaging within it that I hope you'll read the whole book, a whole uh, chat. Well, yeah, go ahead and home read the whole book of John. If you do that, send Mike an email and he'll give you a gold star. But if you read the rest of this chapter, read the rest of this chapter, you will also discover the richness that is there. We're going to look at the first seven verses. Let me tell you a little bit about what was going on. Do you know that Jesus and the Pharisees did not have the best relationship in the scriptures? Uh, Jesus came talking about life everlasting and life after death, and that was their thing. They were the first ones in Hebrew tradition to talk about life after death. And then Jesus comes along, and in the Gospel of John, uses this wonderful phrase, ego ami, out of the Greek, I am. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And all of a sudden, he was out Phariseeing the Pharisees in their message. And so they didn't like him a whole lot, because they had a lot of rules you had to keep. Not necessarily the relationship that Jesus was establishing. So just before this passage in the ninth chapter, Jesus has been in the temple and the Pharisees and Jesus have gotten into a bit of an argument. They said, oh, you must be possessed by a demon, even accusing him of demon possession. And as he's walking away, he's walking out, we have this wonderful passage for today from John 9. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. And we must work the, work, work, we must work the works of him who sent me. While it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said this, he spat on the ground, he made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes and saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And then he went and washed and came back able to see. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Wow. What an incredible story. A man born blind from birth. Now give it to the disciples. <laughs> they had been with Jesus for some time toward in this particular passage in the gospel. They had followed Jesus, walked along the path. They'd seen, they've seen water changed into wine. 
uh, good feat for, for a good party, I guess. The wedding would continue for a few more days after it, it started then. And then they had seen walking on water. They had, they had, they had seen so many powerful things, lame walking. Oh, this was incredible stuff. And then they see this man born blind. And they reverted themselves back to the old theology and rules and said, Now, now uh, Jesus, tell us. Who sinned, his parents or him? <laughs> Isn't it nice that we can always point at others and say, see those sinners over there? Uh, I have a good friend who speaks around the country, Leonard Sweet, and every, one, every time he speaks to a crowd for the very first time, he gets up and he says, good morning, si- good morning sinners. <laughs> Nobody says anything. He says, good morning, saints. Nobody says anything. He says, I'm going to try that one more time. Good morning, saints. Nobody says anything again. The second time he goes through, he says, good morning, sinners. And everybody claps and says hello. He got his point across. And we always want to point at others and say, now, those are the people who are sinning over there. So, uh, Jesus, who is this man born blind uh, from birth? Is it his parents or is it him? And Jesus automatically breaks the rule just like that. It breaks the theological misunderstanding that that his blindness didn't come from sin. He said, oh, no, 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 neither one, neither his parents nor he has sinned. This was done so that the glory of God might be revealed through through him and for, uh, for what we're about to do. And then Jesus does this amazing thing. He, he, he spat upon the ground, the scripture says, and he, he took the, the mud and he made it into a mud pack and he put it on the eyes of this man. And he said, now go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And, and, and he does that. And can, now, can, now think about this from the blind man's perspective. Uh, he may have heard Jesus talk in the temple or nearby, but imagine <laughs> he's talking to him now. People didn't talk to him. It was not the tradition. You didn't talk to people who might be sinners. And better yet, uh, how many times do we avoid people who may have some disability and just simply walk by them and talk about them, but not to them? Even the disciples did that. Lord, <laughs> who sinned? Does him or, or his parents? Not talking to him about what happened. But now Jesus is talking to this man and says, you know, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, if you're blind and somebody puts something wet and sticky on your eyes, what would happen to you? (laughs) Would you say, oh boy, I'm glad we got that. (laughs) Or would you say, I'm afraid. But he said, go and wash. Now notice here that he's not quite sure what's going to happen. But he does it. He obeys. He goes. He washes that away. And when he comes back, he's able to see. I wish I could tell you that that was the end of the story. That we could then say, and, uh, say at that very moment, <laughs> yay, praise God. All the people got together and started singing victory in Jesus. And, and everybody, uh, everybody, they, they they created a fellowship supper, decided they're going to have a barbecue, uh, make, raise some money and build a church in the ark. No, that's not what they were going to do. What they did was they said, are you that guy that was blind? The people didn't even believe it had happened. It couldn't be true, this guy. <laughs> and then the story gets even worse. Because then they take this guy into the temple to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees see him, and they tell him what's been going on. And and the Pharisees ask the guy, you know, were you really blind? You know, he'd been there of age. He'd been there for many, many days, years, and months, blind, probably begging. (laughs) And they said, were you really blind? Then he talks about what happened and that this man Jesus has done that. And then they began to argue with him and they said, oh no, you know that Jesus, he's a sinner. He's possessed of a demon. And so they start messing with him and talking to him and saying, oh, this can't be from God. And this man's going, wait wait a minute, I was blind and now I can see it's got to be from God, right? (laughs) And so they said, well, call his parents and we'll check this out. Call his parents. You know what they want to do? They're going to challenge those parents to say, oh, no, he wasn't really blind. 
we've just been kidding you all these years. He wasn't really blind, and this man didn't really heal him. Uh, that's what the Pharisees wanted him to say. And they started to pin him down. But they're looking at their son, who for all those years had been blind, and is now seeing. They looked at him, and with great courage they said, We don't know, ask him. We don't know, ask him. He's of age. Why? Because they were going to throw them out of the temple if they said this man Jesus had healed him. And that's exactly what the Pharisees wind up doing. Throwing this poor man out of the temple. But you know what? I think the reason they did that is because they started asking this man's questions. And this man started calling Jesus a prophet. And they started calling and they started talking to this man. And this man said, well, he, he must be from God because my eyes were blinded and now I can see. And when he did that, they began to question him even more. And he said, well, the questions you're asking, you must, be one, well, must want to be his disciples. And they said, you're out of here. You're out of here. Wow, there's so much in that story. And then Jesus comes trotting back along. He heard that the man had been thrown out of the temple, and so Jesus goes and he finds him. A lost sheep, if you will, in some respects. He goes and he finds him. Because when they had asked him in the temple who it was, he said, I don't know, I didn't see him. I was blind. And so when he comes and Jesus is there before him and he is told and understands that Jesus is the one who had given him the sign of sight, his response is, I believe. I believe. Remember what the end of the gospel says? These signs are here so that you may believe and have life. So much packed into one little chapter of the Gospel of John. When the beloved disciple, whoever that must have been, uh, when the beloved disciple begins to write that, that Gospel and he comes to this story, you can almost feel the, the, the agony and the pain of blindness, but you can also feel, you can also feel the, the, the pressure and the intensity of the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees and, and how, how sometimes that conflict affected hurt on all those around, especially those who were the followers of Jesus. So much there. But there's some very important things for us to gather from this gospel. From this particular story, there's some personal things that we learn. There's some things that are powerful for us in our own lives. And for us as the gathered community of faith, we call the church. First of all, (laughs) I think this is so important. Jesus was willing to get messy to give the sign of the proclamation of the kingdom of God and the salvation that would come. Jesus didn't just wasn't walking along. Now there's one story of Jesus walking along and a woman touches the hem of his garment and the woman is healed and he has to turn. But this time Jesus is willing to get his hands dirty. <laughs> get his hands dirty. Now I've got, I've got a four-year-old grandson who just about right now is probably singing. Uh, he's four years old and he's in the little choir uh, at uh, State Street Methodist Church in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and he's going to sing this morning. I was on FaceTime with him last night. He said, Pop, Pop, <laughs> Mommy said I have to wear my clean pants tomorrow. <laughs> now, <laughs> uh, if you knew that little four-year-old, you know he likes to roll and, and, and tumble. And, and, and Anyway, so, so I know he's singing with his clean pants on. Sometimes... We have to realize Jesus wasn't just walking around slinging out signs and miracles. Jesus sees a man born blind, spat upon the ground, got his hands dirty, made a mud pie, stuck it on this man's face and told him to go and wash. He was willing to get in the dirt so that this man could see. We live lives that we hope would be somewhat sanitary as Christians. But you and I know 
that life can get messy. Sometimes we get our own hands dirty. Sometimes things don't go well. Sometimes the world around us is messy. Sometimes we are challenged as the kingdom of God and God's gathered community of faith we call the church to get our hands dirty. I am thankful that in my life and in the lives of all of us gathered here, there is nothing so messy in our lives that Jesus is not willing to get his hands dirty to heal. That he's not willing to get his hands dirty so that he is willing to get his hands dirty so that, so that he can affect our ability to see the glory and the kingdom of God and the love and the grace of God that is so powerful around us. Yet you ever felt so separated from those that love you, so separated from the kingdom of God, so separated that you just felt like there was no way out? Well, it's that into that messiness of life, Jesus comes. And guess how he comes in physical form? By those of us who have had our eyes opened when we were blind. We are coming to bring love to the unloved. We're coming to bring joy to those who have no joy. We're coming to bring a sense of hope to those who are hopeless. God gives us the task of being, <laughs> being the people who are willing to get our hands dirty so that we can reach out to the rest of the world and let them know that God, God does love them, that God has created in them the very presence and essence of God, and we want them to claim that and know it and feel the grace and the power of God. Jesus was willing to get his hands dirty. And this man received the sign. But there's even one more piece to that. As modern Christians, if we are willing to get messy and to share the signs of God's glory and grace in this world, we have to be careful that we don't show the wrong signs. <laughs> um, I don't have a I don't have a very clear ability to find my way from one place to the other without a map or a GPS. Have you ever followed a sign that you thought was the right sign and you went to the wrong place? So uh, I was in seminary uh, at Spring Garden in Union Grove in Cherokee County, uh, and my district superintendent uh, Duncan Hunter, some of you may remember Duncan Hunter if you're of, of an age to remember Duncan. Duncan was kind of my mentor and I appreciate all that he did to teach me and, and help me learn about being a pastor and I was serving these little two small churches. He called me on a Saturday night and he said, Rick, I'm so sick, I, I cannot be tomorrow at Mountain Chapel. And he said, so I, I need you to go over uh, and preach at Mountain Chapel, which is in Cherokee County, over just beyond, oh, probably eight or nine miles from where I was serving. He said, if you'll go over there, it's at 11 o'clock uh, and preach for them. I'll send a lay speaker to come and speak at your two churches. And, and, but, but this is their homecoming. I don't want to make sure that somebody is there for something special. So would you go? I said, <laughs> I did what every good preacher does when the district superintendent calls him and says, yes, sir, I will. I'm joking. <laughs> Not a lot, but I'm joking. <laughs> And so I get in the car, I thought I, know where I, was, where, I thought I knew where I was going, and, and so I missed a couple of turns. I don't know how many of you have ever driven in the country, but sometimes you get a little bit, there are no street signs, and so I'm going down this road and that road, and I thought I knew the shortcut, but it wasn't a shortcut, and I'm looking, and it's, 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 uh, it's five minutes till 11, and I'm getting really nervous because I like to be on time or before, and I'm really, I'm really going now, trying to go, and then, then it's 11.04, and I'm really panicked now, and so I top this little hill, and and I, and I topped this little hill, I saw a sign and it had a cross and flame on it. I said, yes, I'm there. And so I whipped in and there were people standing on the front porch and, and kind of milling around. I thought, oh my gosh, they're about to leave. So I, cal I swung out of the car and I said, uh, Dr. Hunter sent me this morning to come and preach for you. And I said, I'm sorry I'm late and I apologize for being late. And they kind of looked at each other and said, well, okay, we'll come right in. And they came in, they sat down, I got up, they sang some songs, I preached at Big Oak Grove. 
I didn't read the sign. Uh, it was the first good Methodist church I came across, and by George, I was going to preach there because the district superintendent sent me to preach there. They, weren't, they were only had church on the first and third Sundays, not on the second and fourth, and this was the fourth Sunday. They were going home from Sunday school to eat lunch. Somebody had some burnt roast that day. Sometimes we can put the wrong signs out. Sometimes, as the church, we put signs that would actually keep us from gathering people into the kingdom of God. Signs that project distrust and fear rather than the love and grace of God. Signs that isolate us from the world that is so much in need of a loving and caring God that we, as God's people, are called to reach and to, to gather in his name. So I hate to say it reminds me of an old song. <laughs> and thank goodness I'm not in uh, a service this morning. I think there's some of you people that will actually know this song. Because uh, I see some of you have s some of the same hair color that I have. Sign, sign, everywhere sign. Blocking out the scenery, breaking my mind. Do this, don't do that, can't you read the sign? Yeah, uh, for those that might remember, that's the five-man electric band. And the sign said, everybody welcome. Come in, kneel down and pray. But when they passed around the plate at the end of it all, I didn't have a penny to pay. So I got me a pen and a paper and I made my own little sign. I said, thank you, Lord, for thinking about me. I'm alive and doing fine. Sign, sign, everywhere a sign. Blocking out the scenery, breaking my mind. Do this, don't do that. Can you read the sign? The signs that we put up in this world need to be signs that don't, don't block out the kingdom of God, that does not block out the powerful grace and love of God. The signs that we as the church need to proclaim are signs that are, are welcoming those into the kingdom of God because we know we ourselves at some point have been in the messiness on the blindness of this world. So this is the sign a man born blind sees and believes. And I leave you with two questions. What blindness keeps us from the love and grace of God? Are we willing to get messy with Jesus so that we may see? And once we're no longer blind, are we willing to get our own hands dirty so that those who are blind around us will see the same love and grace which is a sign to them that has been made real in us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, thank you for joining us, and I hope that you found this message to be meaningful and life-giving. I look forward to you joining us next time, either on our live stream on Sunday mornings here at Bluff Park United Methodist Church. It's at 10 o'clock a.m., or if you want to join us in person, you're welcome to do so. Also here at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. You can find out more about our church family, who we are, what we do, and how to get involved, as well as more information about our worship services at www.bluffparkumc.org. Hope you have a great week, and we look forward to seeing you next time.